One of them that caught my eye was the explanation of the Rambam. Rambam. In this case, it's the Rambam, which mentioned oh. the Rambam. Oh. The Maimonides is reasoning that the Torah prohibits chametz, leaven, and honey in korbanot. You know, korbanot are not to have. Leaven, for example, all our menachot, our cham, our chametz, are, are not chametz. They're they're unleavened. Why is that? Except for um, except for no 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 chametz. Except for once a year. The shte halechem for, for Shavuot. Shavuot requires two breads, which are bread, which are actually chametz. Okay? But all the other times they're not chametz. Okay? So why? What's wrong with chametz? And the second, I mean, I'm not talking about Pesach, all korbanot every day, right? And yamim tovim and so on. And the other one is dvash. What's wrong with honey? Honey's nice, right? Tune. Okay, well, yes. that's what we have to come to, is it? We, we think that the korbanot should be from the choicest, nicest, beautiful animals, right? And yet, and it has to have no blemish, it has to be ideal, and yet honey you cannot add to any korbanot or any menachot, you can't add honey. Second of all, why do we need salt? Korbanot all has to have salt. I, I agree with you, Shannon, on that. That, those are two topics the Ramban discusses. Good, but uh, I'm, I'm ready to listen before we read, if you like, or whatever. Okay, because salt is the, um, the neutralizer between uh, acid and base. Acid plus base yields salt plus water. So we need two extremes, violent extremes. And, and put them together, you, you get salt. Water. It's, it, it, it is and which extremes are we talking about here that we have put acid, together? Acid, the, acid. No, no, I mean in, in the korbanot. What's the idea? Well, what, uh, what's the nimshal? I mean, yeah. Uh, well, let's that's say that's that's uh, uh, anger and, um, uh, and you know, the, uh, in, temp in temperament. Um, but anyway, I'm telling you, I'm telling you what the what the characteristic of salt is. Salts right? are a result of interaction between two, this acid and base. I guess, I guess the, the salt has the ability to extract, to bring out the real flavor, the real aroma, the real Okay, sense. That's what salt okay. also does. I mean, he, we're, so we're brainstorming, that's right? The corbanol you know, must you, be you're, you're in correct. The, He's saying, right, you, you, deeper. you put salt on something and it and it extracts Defense. the juices, the, the, the flavor, right? You put it on, on food, it makes it taste better. You, it, it, you put on salt and it draws out the blood, it draws out fluid from something, you know, osmosis. Yes. It, it creates, creates osmosis from the thing that you put it on, it oozes out Perfect. to... to to equalize, uh, and we know that that's the reason for osmosis, but it does equal, it does bring out things. Mm -hmm. So you're saying it, it does what in the korban? What's the idea? To to bring out all our deepest thought, our deepest uh, feeling. The korban you know, is about korban. us. Is if the korban is about us, so the, so. the salt will bring out the depth, something in the depth. So Anything so else? So Salt's preservative. So it's preservative. Yes, preservative, preservative, right? Yes. Things don't spoil with salt. Right. So mm, it makes things long lasting. What's the idea in a korban? I mean, the korban is going to be either burned or it's going to be eaten in a day. 
what's the idea of making something that is a preservative on a korban? I mean, in other words, I understand that that's what it does. The question yeah. is, what's the idea oh, that it should be included, dafka, in all korban? No korban. You must not leave out salt. Every korban has salt. Right? Cool. So there's something important about it. I mean, the, the Torah says, right? So the Rambam discusses those two things. One, he quotes the Rambam concerning the Dvash honey and uh, chametz, and the other one is his own discussion about salt. So, you want to do those two things? Fine, that's nice. Eh? Yeah. Yeah, do you have the Bible? You do. You have it. I do too. So uh, if we want to know where that is, I'll tell you upon which pasuk that comes to discuss. Um, the first we'll talk about chametz and dvash unless you want to go the other way. Anyway, the one comes before the other, so it doesn't matter. Perik Beit, chapter two, verse eleven. Okay. Uh, well, I don't know. A page in the in the Ramban. It is in page Yud Zayin of, of Vayikra, of course. Yes, yes, we are in a new book. I, 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 Did you bring the correct one? Well, no, but I, then I, I, I mended my... You, you, corrected your, you, you corrected your crime, <laughs> and, you, and, you, and you made up for it. Okay. Um, no me, no. So first of all, let's, let's talk about the, um, the Pasuk itself, right? Ch- yes. Chapter 2, you, you already have it, uh, Rabbi uh, Eliyahu? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, yes, you're way ahead of me. Let's see. Two, what part? Ch- chapter no, 11. Me, chapter bring, 2, verse 11. Which ye shall bring unto the Tehran shall be made with lemon. With lemon, yeah. Okay. Uh, 11. Yes. The. Okay. Great. Yeah. Right? Lo te'ase chameiz. Right? Lo te'ase chameiz. Ki kos or, by, by the way, very interesting. I mean, we'll see in a second. It seems like by the by, the dvash. Ki kol chamei. Keep reading in the English. Yes. Because for do the keep reading. Oh, you don't have it. No, no, they you don't have the Bible. No, ah, I don't have it. Could you read the Bible? Ki kos or v'chol dvash v'zakiru mimenu isha v'ashem. Okay, so what's the translation? Because when he um oh. A meal offering that you offer to Hashem. Meal offering is the is the flower offering, right? The the uh, we're not talking about korban yeah. of an animal. This is a meal yeah. offering, a uh, grain, grain, a grain offering, right? Mincha, for example, right. right? So that those meal offerings that you go ahead oh, offer to Hashem, Hashem shall not be prepared leavened. Leavened. Yeah. Period. That's that's first statement number one. Mm-hmm. For you shall not cause to go up in smoke from any leavening or fruit honey as a fire offering to Hashem. Hmm. A little peculiar, right? Because if you wanted to tell me no leaven, you say no leaven. And then if you want to tell us no dvash, no honey, mm-hmm. say no honey. Mm-hmm. He says, shall not all of the all of the grain offerings shall not be prepared leavened. For you shall not offer the burnt offering of grains with leaven or dvash or honey to put up in fire and smoke. It's a peculiar way of including dvash into the prohibition. He says, well, not to do leaven. And then it says, for you shouldn't do leaven or dvash. It, it, it sort of um, uh, suggests that uh, chametz is not only um, a bad thing, on the Pesach, it's a bad thing year round. Yeah. Uh, well, in some way, for yeah. some reason. Yeah. We're not told not to eat chametz. We're right. told not to put it on any of the leaven, uh, any of the sacrifices for right. for chametz. This looks like a contradiction because Hashem says all, all, most of the, of, the, of the times that he he, he enjoy with the with the aroma, with the smelling of of our offerings. So why here this? Forbidden us to. Yeah, he certainly, he certainly doesn't mean that he physically enjoys the aroma. Yeah, of course. But I mean, the idea. Of something I didn't mean to be really lousy smelling, but uh, the whole idea of the smoke. The Rambam wants to make sure that we don't understand, and the Ramban also 
wants to make sure we don't understand this as anthropomorphic when God is suggesting the imbibing of smoke or, or odor, it means appreciating or, you know, you know it is a appreciating or receiving. When we smell something, we are taking something into ourselves. When you're seeing something, you're taking... When, when we say Hashem sees, does it mean He has eyes to see? Does it mean when He hears you, He's got ears yeah. to hear? So, okay. I mean, that's a, that's a separate question. Let's uh, For a moment. But it's, it's a problem what it is that we're trying to stay away from, right? right. So the Ramban, let's see what the Ramban says. So in the Pasuk Yud Aleph, He says that we should start from the words Vita'am. Uh, I see, he tries to answer the first question in the beginning. He says, you know, we, we, I, I just asked that question, why mention it twice, you know? Don't do it leavened, for you shouldn't do leavened for the for the, for the, for the for the burning of it. Well, he says, even that part which you, the, you know, the Kohen grasped a little bit of the leaven, of the, of the grain, to put on the fire. The, the haktara of, you know, the whole, the whole grain platter, like a matzah, was not put on the fire. That was eaten by the Kohanim. But while the flour and the water was mixed, the Kohen would take a, a portion of it, like this, in his hand, and he would take it to the Mizbeach and he would put it on the fire. So the repetition of the chametz twice here is, you shouldn't make the pan of all the grain and the oil to allow it to be chametz, ever. Right? And even if you didn't make that chametz, you should also know that when the Kohen takes this thing with his hand, he must not let that become chametz before he puts it on the fire. Mm -hmm. The fire offering is also not to be chametz. So you could sometimes have no chametz in the pan, and then if you let it get wet or you wait for a while, it will become chametz before yeah. you put it on. So he says that's the, that's the additional statement. Okay, mm -hmm. good. petamim omrim. Who's petamim? 93. I don't know. Oh, okay. Now, the dvash, the honey... Since we're talking about fire, now we're talking about the part that's going to go on the fire and the smoke that comes from it, there are those people who are experts in uh, incense, mm -hmm. expert in, uh, in uh, you know, there are people who make incense in a room and it makes the whole room smell good and uh, atmosphere nice for you, meditation or for whatever, mm -hmm. to people to enjoy. So people say that honey is actually very nice for that. Honey is a very nice, like you said, makes things smell good, makes things a nice atmosphere. So nevertheless, you might think, therefore, honey is good. So the Torah is saying, no, on, on the fire that goes on the Mizbeach, you don't ever put honey. And he's going to discuss why in a minute, even though, it, even though it seems to be a luxurious, wonderful thing. Okay. Okay. Okay, the, the end of the the end of the two, four, five, the end of the fifth line. Vitam. You see that? Yeah. Let's we can skip the other technical uh, right? Uh, a little question, sure. And the reason. Taktiru is related with the ketoret. The, the ketoret with is the... called ketoret. Listen to me. The ketoret is called ketoret because it is burnt for smoke. That's what kitor. Kitor means smoke. So ketoret, that special sacrifice of the all the b'samim, all the incense and all the spices that are put together to make that special offering of the ketoret is called ketoret because it goes up in smoke. So therefore, when we take anything else, like the grain, and we put it on the fire, we are maktir, we are burning something to make to make smoke. It's not the same, it's not the same thing. Mm -hmm. it's, the verb is called lehaktir. Okay. You know, to smoke something, to, to burn something. Okay, right. fine. So now let's say the ta'am. The reason. Thank you. You see that, uh, the, the, the portion? Yes, sir. The, the reason. Hakatuv she yaskir min chahi. Ve'ichtov hu. 
There's a he and a who. <laughs> Did you see that? I didn't see that. It's feminine. Um, Chameitz. I don't know. I don't know. Where, where is where does he take he and who? What does he talk about? He ninety-five ninety-five uh be yud be Oh it does? Look Tatiri me menu? No. Where's the who and he? Do you see that a word there? He calls it or but what is the who should, and he? Should, why why is he discussing who and he with a vav and a... You should talk about the Tatiru Mayhem. Oh, that's what he's talking about? I, I don't know, but I'm, I'm just that's saying... That's what he's asking? Another, no, another, no, I don't know. I don't You're know. right, but that's not what he's discussing. I mean, it is true that Mincha is, oh, Mincha, he, oh, 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 look back at Pasuk Vav. Look at, back at Pasuk 6. When it's described how to make a Mincha. Mincha pitim. To be read, minchahi. But it's written minchahu with a vav. Right? It is, it is written with a vav, but it is called he. So mincha is a feminine v- word, and yet in the Torah it is written he vav aleph like a masculine, masculine. word. I think that's what he's talking about in that pasuk. Korban. So what's the point? Korban is mentioned. Right, korban hu, shemet mincha, minchat, korban mincha hu, he. <laughs> okay, well that's the problem. That's, I don't know why it's important for us now. V'chein b'kol makom, mi'parshat, mi'fareshet, heina anochi sholeach, oh, hinei, oh, sorry, mi'parshat, hinei anochi sholeach malach lefanecha. That's interesting, 96. If you remember in Shemot, Hashem had said to Moshe, don't worry about it, I'm going to send an angel with you to take you to Eretz Israel, yes. which Moshe rejected. Remember that? Yes. So that one, that one, it said, he has a quote here, in Shmot Chav Gimel, okay, Vain Rebbeinu Bach Yasham, Shem Mepharish Dim Rebbeinu Khan, Ubechor Zahav Mevi B'Shem Pirush Al Sudot Arabam, Kisham Nehmar, Kishmi Bekirbo, footnote 95, yeah, 96, Kisham Nehmar, Kishmi bekirbo, v'chein kan hanekeva bichlal hazachar. Eh? Somehow the feminine is included in the masculine. I, I don't quite understand what he's talking about. V'chein ha'isha ha'hi. Oh, there is another place in the in the Dvarim in Deuteronomy where it says that woman. That woman is obviously feminine, right? And it says ha'hi ha'hi that woman. And yet it's written with a vav, mm-hmm. as though masculine. So what's the problem? Ki ba'avur shahanekeva bichlal hazachar bikoach. How does he translate that? The um, feminine is... So, so ha'isha ha'hi, that woman, is written ha'hu in the masculine. Yeah, yeah. While it is, it is read ha'hi in the feminine, because the feminine is potentially included in the masculine. It is possible that the potentially. reason... Potentially. Potential. What does it mean? Wait, wait, before you go on, what does he mean by that? That the feminine included. is potentially included in the masculine. I mean, feminine is whole. Um, hmm. I don't know what he means by potential. The Korach usually means potential. That's true. So. Not in reality, but in potential. Like a, if you had a like, a, uh, like a woman is, you know, potentially a uh, male. Let's say, I mean, if, if you took a, if you took off the uh, penis or whatever it is, 
then you every every uh, month any female. You took off the penis. And but he's saying that a woman is included in the male. Oh, is that what you mean? That a male includes a woman? Get out. <laughs> Truth is, a man has an XY chromosome, and yes. a woman has an XO chromosome, right? XO. So the woman doesn't have or an XX chromosome. She has two X's, and we have an X and a Y. So I don't understand what he means. Oh, well, let, let's keep going. Vitam has orba Okay, now this is the tam that we're supposed to discuss, I think, because the other one is too mysterious for me. Okay, and now, why the leaven and the, and the honey? Maybe That's what he's asking. Yitachem, it's possible. Shehu kitivei harab b'morin Oh, you see, he's quoting the Rambam yes. in the Guide for Perplex. That's what this notebook had said. Amar, he said the following. Shematza b'sifrehem. How do you like that? He saw in their books, meaning the books of idolaters. Shehamin hagaya b'ovdei avodah zara custom among idol worshippers, la hakriv kol min chatam chametz, all of their offerings of grain were made leavened, ula arev hadvash v'kol bar kobarehem, and to mix honey into all of their offerings. V'lachein asram legavoa. And therefore the Torah goes out of its way to make a distinction between what you're going to do for God and what other people do for their gods. Meaning that the Rambam doesn't really discuss much the idea of chametz versus non chametz or dvash versus non chametz. Just what they do, we don't want you to do, right? Let's say uh, for a moment, for a moment. I mean, the Rambam at least doesn't say it in that sentence. He doesn't comment on the reasons. Just make a difference, right? If, for example the idol worshippers would always wear a yarmulke, then we shouldn't wear a yarmulke. Right? If the idol worshippers would do something of a certain way, in a certain way, then we would not do it that way. To show that we are different from them. Right? Me, to train ourselves in a different way. All right. Fine. Good. Now, of course, you might say that they thought of Levin and Advash because they thought it made for a beautiful korban. It's done something very nice. I want to offer my idol something of the highest quality. A matzah, you know, that's not leavened, is easier to make. It didn't take a lot of work to do. It doesn't look very rich. If you want to have a Shabbos challah, you want to have a Shabbos challah that's risen nicely, right? I mean, it's nice and rich. So if I want to give God something nice and rich to show that God, that I value him, I give him that. And not only that, if it's sweet, then all the better. Right? Honey, not just um, tasteless. Right? So that's why they would do that for their idols. But nevertheless, that's very interesting, right? That the Torah wants you to take you away from their customs so much that we sort of like go upside down. We dafka do a grain offering that's poor looking and that doesn't have any honey and sweets. So it's almost like like cutting off our nose to spite our faces, so to speak. You know what I mean? Uh, here's something nice that they do for their God. Mm -hmm. We will not do that even though it's nice. Mm -hmm. Even mm -hmm. though it's nice. Right. Right, so, but that's the Rambam so far. I think the Rambam will probably discuss. And in the same way, our sages have said, This goes even further. Right? A Matseva is a monument. Is a, mm -hmm. Like a stone monument. Who who made a matzeva? Uh, no. Nimrod. Alva never made a matzeva that I that I know of. He made he made his beach. Yisrael. And he planted an Asia. right? Yisrael. Not Yisrael either. I don't remember Yisrael. Yeah. 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 Okay, Yaakov. Where did Yaakov make a matzeva? Beitel. In Beitel. When he after the fa after the dream that he had. He put up a matzeva, right? And uh, so that was a beloved thing to do. He he made a matzeva, the Hashem, in the place in which God spoke to him in, in Beitel, right? 
So now we're not talking about things that were originated by idol worshippers, right? We're talking about one of our forefathers that did that. It's even so, so of course we should do it too, right? I mean, don't you want to follow in Yaakov's ways? So he's now going to say that even though, even though Amatseva once once beloved by the Kaddish Baruch Hu because our one of our forefathers did that, right? Hashem, and later God rejects it. He abhors it, a monument. Because the idol worshippers adopted it and made it their way of worshipping, we therefore now dislike it. So that goes even more extreme, right? Mm -hmm. It gives them too much power, though. Who? Uh, the guy here. Why? Yeah, that's right. I mean, if you're going to so, so the, uh, they would tell... Um, so maybe Master Brahim uh, 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 It's a very good question. I mean, that, that, of course, the reason we're doing this now when I'm elaborating is because it, it brings up a, a, a quandary, right? What does that mean? Let's say the Catholic Church would decide that everybody should wear tzitzit. <laughs> it's very beautiful. Yeah. But we have to. We have to stranger. So maybe we should then, and the Chachamim then would say, you know, you shouldn't wear tzitzit anymore. Or certainly not wear it out anymore because then it would look like... Yeah. I mean, so in other words, what... What category? How do you function? Where where does you put an end to it, right? Especially if we say it's beautiful, right? We're not talking about something that's abhorrent. There are all kinds of orgies, let's say, that they made in certain idol worshiper cults, right? Orgies or uh, things that were immoral, right? In front of their gods. Or cutting people up and slashing themselves and letting blood fly and so like the, the, the flagellantes, you know, or whatever they call them. Mm -hmm. So we say, that's bad, that's bad, you know, and they think that they're doing it something special for their God. We would never do that. Or, or human sacrifice, you know. But here is something that is dafka beautiful, and we say, no, no, we don't do that. And here is something that our own forefathers did, but then they adopted it, so we now reject it as well. So that's a problem, right? We'll see. What is it, sir, right? God says, I don't want a... Matseva, I don't want a monument, I, I do not like that. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And that Pasuk is in Dvarim. Okay. Mm -hmm. So he stops there, by the way. The Rambam said what he said. And it's very interesting. Uh, we, we did not read in this Parsha, there's a major two, three page argument. I didn't want to get into it because we would not stop until tomorrow morning. Between the Rambam and the Ramban about Korbanot in general. In general. The Rambam there proposes that the way we do Korbanot in the Beit HaMikdash, we slaughter animals, we sprinkle the blood, we do all those things, is because people were stuck with the idea of sacrificing. Why were they sort of, the tendency was to sacrifice? Because they saw all kinds of other cultures and idol, or idol worshippers called sacrifice. And God could not imagine telling them, no more sacrifice. No, we don't sacrifice, because I hate sacrifices, I don't want sacrifices, because they do that. In, he didn't think it would be possible. Sounds very strange, right? Instead, he wanted to say, here's the Mishkan, and it's only in this place that you bring sacrifice, not in just every old place. And you do it my way, you do it in this special way, right? So, to the Rambam, at least in that text, the whole things that we do are ways of trying to control our passions that are similar to the idol worshippers that we couldn't get away from. Mm -hmm. The Ramban goes crazy about such a statement. Because he says, what, are you kidding? You mean to say that all of the mitzvot about Korban Note, this whole book of Shemot, this whole book of, of Shemot into Vayikra, of all those parshiot, all those details, forever and ever, right, that we have these sacrifices, is just in order to wean us from bad habits? Are you kidding? Impossible, can't be, can't be, right? Instead, the Ramban believes absolutely that the Korbanot and their details is a 
secret, spiritual high point. Not something that we're trying to restrict and restrain, but something dafka that has a language that is mystical, special, and so on and so on, right? And he says, look, uh, if you look back in humanity, the, the Cain and Hebel, he brought a sacrifice. Noah brought a sacrifice. We're not talking about uh, bad habits. We're talking about what humans, people do. It's an impulse of sacrificing to God. So he, he a very long argument. So if we remember the Rambam feeling the way he did and the Ramban feeling the way he did, here is the Ramban quoting the Rambam about the reason we don't do leaven and we don't do dvash because he heard that that's what the idol worshippers do so we don't do it. And he doesn't make any comment about it and he doesn't say anything about it. He doesn't reject it. He's, he just quotes the Rambam. Mm -hmm. Now, you would think you would think that the Ramban, who thinks that everything has got ideas that are very special ideas, not just because we're trying to get away from the, not, from the, from the idols, you would think that he would introduce a comment and said, that's very nice what the Ramban thinks, but I think, right, according to me, that this is very important. I'll tell you something about Chametz, and I'll tell you something about Dvash, and I'll tell you something about not Levin, and so on, and, and, to give some idea, some spiritual ideas about it. And instead, he just leaves it alone. He just quotes the Rambam, and that's that. That's peculiar, no? Mm -hmm. But uh, the Rambam looks like uh, he's, he's contradicting himself because in the in Morene Bohim, he said the Rambam. That, Rambam, yeah. He said that that is the way that God wanted to us to take it, but adapt it. You know, the first point. But in the Mishnetra, he said. No, it's because the, what you're saying, the essence, the, the, the potentiality of the of the code of, of the of the commandments of the, of the korbanot. Of the korbanot. So where does it say that? Uh, in the Yara Hazaka. It yeah. says in Murad of Luchim, it says the idea that we should do it. We should. It was only to uh, to move us away from my right. worship. Right. But right. in, in Mishnah Torah, it, it says. It says it, it's this is it is a column it of our it 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 we should do it um, without any reference to the game. Right. Nothing to do with the game. Exactly. It's like a, well, it, it's, it's, well, it's, that's that's okay. I mean, but the reason we were given these mitzvot. But you know, why should we do this forever? That, well, that's the Ramban's challenge to him. That's the Ramban's challenge. You, Rambam, who say that this is the only reason, that's the reason they were given, <laughs> then uh, who needs it, right? And is that the only reason? Uh, so on and so on. Wait, so on. Wait, Those are all the challenges yeah. that the Ramban gives against the Rambam. I don't know. I don't, know the, I don't, I don't hear the Rambam responding, but uh, I mean... All right, so here the Drash and Mela and, 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 and Pachamets, he doesn't seem to comment. You know, you could, I'm sure you can make a... Um, a rabbinic drasha for Shabbos morning about it without having to do with the Rambam or the Ramban. You could say, well, chametz, why do we don't have chametz on Pesach? Because chametz is, uh, you know, you let something rise, it shows pride, it shows richness, but before God you want to be very humble, so you bring something very humble, like a flatbread that isn't high, you know, and uh, whatever. You can make up stories. But the Ramban doesn't even try. The Ramban just says, he quotes the Ramban and leaves it at that. I am a little frustrated. I'm sure if you look around at other Mephashim, you'll find ideas about Chametz and ideas about Dvash that make it rejectable, mm -hmm. rejected in the, in the Korban. But the Ramban doesn't say it. Now he talks about salt right away. Yeah, he goes to the next thing. And the reason for salt, he says, that you must do, that you must have, where is that? Where is that? Uh, ah, yeah, Pasuk 13 in the Bible. It says, V'kol korban b'minchatecha, minchatecha b'melech timlach. Lo tashbit melech prit elohecha me'al minchatecha, al kol korbanecha takrit melech. See that? Three times, actually, in that Pasuk. 13, right? Mm -hmm. Salt has to be included, right? And what's this Brit, Melach Brit? It's another question, right? What's Melach Brit? So, okay. Now, what about salt? Amar Gamkein, Kibavur, this is the Rambam, had said, 
כי בעבור שהם ימאסו אותו ולא יקריבוהו כלל. There we דווקא put salt, because they, the idol worshippers, again, he's going on this business of rejecting the other cultures, they, the idol worshippers, hated salt. They rejected salt from their, from their korbanot, so we put it on. Right. Sounds pretty trivial. Yeah. Is like that what a, you're trying to say? Like a, a competence, like a... Yeah, I mean... <laughs> You, 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 you want to make you want to make a point of rejecting them, right? Exactly. Yeah, that's what the, it seems. What the Rambam says now, the Rambam is going to make a comment. And I might say instead, it's possible. Mipnei she'ino derech kavod lihiot lechem Hashem tafel mi bli melach. It is possible, the salt business, that it is not proper and honorable that the bread for God we should be Taste, so tasteful. simple, tasteless, tasteful. without salt. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, you could say it also shouldn't be flat without rising, and it shouldn't be bland without dvash. I mean, I don't know, right? Ketan hi krivehu na lefechatecha, that you shouldn't, uh, you know, you should give it to Hashem, just like you would give it to your prince, to your king, right? So you don't want to give him bread that doesn't have any taste, without any salt, so give it with salt. Now, of course, the, again, the same argument could be, what to the prince, I would probably give a nice risen bread with honey on it as well. Mm -hmm. And therefore, that's why the sages excluded wood and blood. Wood and from blood. What do you mean, wood and blood? From what? From 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 the requirement from, of being from mincha. From mincha. She ain't to uni melach because they do not need salt. Oh, she yesh bekol elas sod ne elam menu. Or maybe now he's finally going into it. Well, he says maybe there's a special secret that is really yeah, unknown to us. us. Some mystery <laughs> unknown to that about these things. Mm -hmm. Because I think he finds it also unsatisfactory. Right? Right? Yeah. And with regard salt, it says, is singular. You notice that? Which is singular. He's talking about the one who brings the mincha, not the one who's going to burn the mincha, which is Aaron and his sons, but the one who brings it. The one who brings it is a single individual, so the melach is the is the one that's included in it. Yeah, the person who puts in the salt could be the person who brings the offering in the first place. I or you, you're not a going, right, Pinky? When so I or you or you come to bring a mincha, you could put together the grain and you could put together the salt, right? And then give it to the Kohen who will then do the Kvitsa and the Haktara and all of that. Thing, right? So since it is you who do, brings the Mincha, you should not withhold any salt as an indiv you individual. Korban Kohanim, as a group, must be doing things in the following way. Right? Not to have leaven, not to let it become leaven, and not to put Tvash on it in addition. All right, fine. Kemo Yitzika Vitam, and therefore you could even mix the oil into it as well, you, Pinky. Wouldn't that be nice? Right. Now, so so far, it sounds a little bit un, yeah. unexciting. Now look at Yud Gimel. You must not uh, cancel or or abolish the salt, the salt of covenant, of covenant. covenant with God. The salt of the covenant of God. What does the salt have to do with covenant? That's referring to Abraham Abino, because Why? he was he was the one that he made it, that kind of breed. With whom? When remember, when 
With Abi Melech? Lechem B'Melech, I think he gave to the Malachim, no? Uh, after that, I think. After that. And the, the, the bears were... Uh, the Brit uh, Renaptarim? The Brit Renaptarim? Yeah. I don't remember Melech. It's very peculiar, this kind of breed, because it's, it's wonderful. But it's yeah, but what's the breed? Salt, a breed, salt breed of, of salt. covenant. Salt of covenant. Why is salt called the covenant? Yeah. And I so have, he's, I have no he's asking that, that question. It was very, 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 very important because I, I couldn't understand what is the meaning when Abraham Abino was making the kind, this kind of, of breed. You know, oh, he, breed to an Abtarim you're talking about. Yeah, but now we're talking about salt. We're not talking yeah. about that one. No, 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 no. You're asking that one as well, the, the but he's asking salt. about the salt. The he's asking salt. about the salt. The Why is it salt the, called a breed? Yeah, Abraham is salt and the breed to an Abtarim? No. No. What's the connection? No, he's asking uh, about what. It's there's no sort of connection between salt and the, and the breed. But after him, he's wondering what's the whole idea of a breed with objects like cutting the animals in half. Just as you can ask, what's the idea of a breed with salt? I mean, why a breed is I make a covenant with you. Do I need a uh, animals cut in half that we walk between? Mm. We'll see. All right. Mm. Anyway. But let's let's stay with the salt, all right? right. What is the idea of Shabrit Kturala Melach Mishesh Jamei Breshit? Because <laughs> because there's a covenant that is was established with salt from the six days of creation. What's that all about? What's that all about? We're not talking about covenant with us. There's a covenant with salt. God made a covenant with salt. <laughs> What's from the six days of creation? What's that? This is not the Ramban. Mm -hmm. What's the idea? You heard this, no? Uh, yeah. God created the world. And there was water mixed up all over the place. Mm -hmm. And what he did, he did a few things. He said that there should be light. Then he separated the light from the, from the darkness. Then he said, there will be a rakia. There will be a a horizon, a, a sky, whatever it is, an atmosphere, mm -hmm. maybe an atmosphere on top of our, our uh, world. And there's going to be water above, and there's going to be water below. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to separate between the water above and the water below, and that's going to be the rakia. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the Medrash says, the water that was above was very happy because, you know, God is above, so to speak, whatever that means. And it's closer to God, and it was, it's still staying there. The water that was below was very, very sad and very angry. What do you mean putting us down here and separating, uh, separating us in the lower world instead of being up? We don't want to be here, the water said. Not fair. So what did the water do? started getting very angry. And when it got very angry, it made waves. Mm -hmm. <sighs> crashing and upping, kind of. you know, and started crying. The water started crying. And when it started crying, oh. it was salty tears, oh. right? So it, obviously it's a matter, right? Yeah. So don't get excited, <laughs> right? But just picture this. Yeah. So there's a conflict now between God and this water. So God says, you stay down there. I have it in my power and I have a good reason that I am forcing you to stay down there, right? Of course, because God knows there's no life without water, right? So there's got to be water down here. So he says, you have to be down there. You have to, this is your job. I don't, you're not going to rebel. I'm not going to let you convince me that I should bring you up. You're going to stay down there. But, but because you are angry and you are rebelling for a good spiritual idea, you don't want to be down there because you want to be up near the holy, uh, you know, non-physical world. So I'll tell you what, I'm going to give you a compensation, a consolation prize. I'll make it up to you. I want you to know that the water that's down here is going to have a special privilege. That from you, there's going to be once a year a special happiness when the water is going to be brought from the deep to home to anoint the Mizbeach in the holiest places, or holy place that I have, and the salt, from the salty water of the sea, yeah? The salt is going to be a special thing I'm going to have. All my korbanot have to have salt. 
right? Now, when you think about that medrash, that sounds a little bit childish, right? I mean, okay, so, okay, I'll stay down here because I could have my water and my salt on the korbanot. But I once thought to myself, this is something I just made up. I don't know if it's true. I thought to myself that it is a consolation. It is a compensation for the water, thinking. The reason that they wanted to go up is because they wanted to be up closer to spirit instead of physical. Hashem is telling them, you're right, you, you, I'm, I'm going to force you to do to be there, right? Just like I force neshama to go into the body on, on human beings as well. The neshama doesn't want to go either, but you're going to go. You're going to be there. In human beings as well, there's a neshama that doesn't want to be there. But I'm telling you, you're going to go down there and you're going to work to prepare and to use the physical world for spiritual things. So you are going to do the same thing. You're going to be there. But I'm going to give you a compensation. The compensation is that your desire to get out of the physical, to go to the spirit, is going to be satisfied. Because from your water and from your melach, there's going to be korbanot. And the korbanot are consumed in the fire of the Mizbeach. And the idea of the korban consumed on the fire of the Mizbeach is you take a physical thing, a material thing, and you create energy, right? You, you're converting physical things into energy that rises, right? Physical to spirit, right? And that's what you wanted, the water, right? That's what you wanted. You wanted not to be there. You wanted to be in spirit. So I'm giving you symbolically that idea on the Mizbeach, the water and the salt, to be there. You understand? I mean, so, I mean, that's the Brit Krutat. So he says, we have to put the salt there because God promised the water that, he, that we will always put salt. Right? That's, our, that's your mitzvah. Never leave salt out because God owes it to the water. Now, why should you be responsible to carry out God's promise? That's my problem. I mean, God, you, you put the salt on his back. What do you want from me? Right? What do you want from me? So answer that question. Why is it your job? Because I want to be with well, yeah, okay. So he owes, he, he, he made a, a commitment, so I have to pay the debt. Okay, it's nice. It's very nice of me to pay God's debts. I mean, very sweet. But there's something more important than that. No, I mean, remember the whole idea that God forced that water to be here is why we are alive. I mean, yeah, I mean, why did God say to the water, you have to be there, you have to be there, you have to be there? Mm -hmm. Because... Because humankind and all spirit, all, all creatures require water. So I created the water, I created the world for you, for Eliyahu, and I made the water, I forced the water to be down on the earth, even though it didn't want to, for Eliyahu. And so I told the water, you must do that for Eliyahu, and I will pay you back. I will pay you back because Eliyahu is going to pay you back, right? Eliyahu is for which you stayed there. He's going to put. He's going to put the the salt on his mouth. It's very. It's very reasonable. It's not God's debt. Mm -hmm. It's God's command. It's God's command to the water for our sake. Mm -hmm. So we bring the salt. I mean, of course, right? Okay. So fine. So so far, that's Rashi. Very nice. It made Rashi a reason. And uh, so when the Rabban says umedrash chachamim hu, he means. Yes, it's true, it's a medrash, it's very sweet, very nice. He doesn't disagree, okay. But he's got a different, he usually when he says that, he says, that's fine, but I've got something else mm -hmm. to say. Ebenezer says, Amar, al derech apshat, hichnasticha bivrit vishbaticha shalota kriv tafel velo yeachel, ki hu derech mizayon. Okay, we already saw that above, right? The Ebenezer says, Hashem says, I made a brit, that I brought you into the covenant with me and I made you promise that you will not sacrifice something that is tasteless and uh, poor and so on. All right, because it's a way of abuse. You know, you're not honoring God when you do that, not putting salt. Uh, we so, were not satisfied. We were not satisfied with that because that's not uh, too... So that was, make a difference between that, was that, and the kind, that was the kind of, of offering that Cain, Cain gave it to Hashem? Because he was there salt there? I don't know. Okay, it doesn't say so. It doesn't say so. Okay, maybe. I don't know. I'm not sure if they knew about salt then, but okay. Could be. Yeah. Well, just as you put it, 
Uh, Cain and Hevel, though, was it? No, Hevel. Hevel brought, Hevel brought an animal. Did he bring salt? Oh, right. Okay, was, I don't know. He, he brought vegetables from the garden. With vegetables. Yeah, but don't forget Hevel. Hevel brought uh, the animal. So, did he bring salt? Okay, I mean, I don't know. Good. Ubavushu who breeds the Korbanot. Yaseh HaKatub Zot HaBrit Av LaKol HaBritot. Now, since it is a promise to put the salt on the on the on the uh, korban, then we have made the brit with salt, symbolic of salt, a sort of like a, a sign or a, a rule for all covenants. Fayomer b'matnot kuhuna u'malchut David brit melach. I want to tell you that the words brit melach is mentioned twice more here with regard to korbanot, two more times in the Torah. One of them is in Korach, right after the defeat of Korach and all of his people, the Torah goes out of its way to tell the people that the Kohanim that were chosen, after all, remember the whole argument was that God didn't chose Aharon, you, you know, didn't talk about it from God's command, right? And they were re defeated. Then God goes out of his way and he says, here, listen, the Kohanim, you're going to be responsible for all the things that happened in the Mikdash, and you're going to carry the responsibility. You may be, you can get easily punished if you don't take care of the Mikdash. He wanted to tell the people, this is not such a great privilege, it's not so easy, right? And they will have certain gifts that are given from the people to the Kohanim, like Korban such and such, a certain part of the meat goes to the Kohen, Mincha such and such, a certain part of the eating goes to the Kohen, but that's what they make a living from. They don't have uh, business, they don't go to the stock market, right? <laughs> and he says, because this is promised to the Kohen, and it is Brit Melach to the Kohen, between me and the Kohanim. The covenant of salt between me and the, and, the, and the Kohanim. Again, salt has nothing to do with the discussion there at all, but it's an expression used, a salt covenant. He's going to explain why in a moment, but that's one other place. Covenant of salt with its sacrifices, covenant of salt with the Kohanim, and covenant of salt with David Melech. For some reason, David Melech is chosen, and God said, it is my promise that David and his descendants after him will be my chosen ones, right? And it is a covenant of salt with me and them. Again, what, what, right? It seems like every time, at least two more times, when the Torah discusses a brit, a covenant, it says covenant of salt, right? So he's saying, the first covenant... There it might be the preservative angle. Might, might, yeah. But now we're going to discuss. So he's going to say why, why these three things are covenant of salt. Why is this salt so important? So he says like this. It is persistent. It's, it's, it's um, ongoing. It is preserved. It's going to last forever, this covenant, between the Kohanim and God, between the king and God, and between the salt and the, and the, and the bringing of the korbanot, forever. So here comes the idea of preservative, right? Melach makes things last, and so when I want to talk about a covenant that I promise you forever I'm going to do this, then I'm going to say, I promise you like with salt that I'm forever going to do this, because salt makes things last forever, right? That's one idea he's trying to say, right? We're going on. Aval Rabbi Abraham Pirei Sham, Brit Kutam Gizrat Eretz Melecha. Here's a different idea completely. Eretz Melecha is a land, salty land. What's a salty land? The salt flats in America, you know, the part of the desert in America and in Arizona, I think, or Nevada. Productive. Totally not productive. Salt flats. You try to grow something there, nothing grows. Right? It is barren completely. Gafrit Ramelach, when we talk about Gafrit Ramelach, we talk about Sodom and Amorah, right? It is full of, of Gafrit, which is like ash and salt. And that is deadly, nothing, nothing grows, right? You look, you go to the Yamamelach today and you, have a, and you go around there and you see the land around there is salt and mineral, cannot grow anything, right? When you go up the hill a little bit, when the water starts coming off the mountains, you have a few shrubs that do grow. But as you get close to the sea, nothing grows there where the sand is salty. Right? So Eretz Melecha, 
Umakoma melech nichrat, the place of salt is cut off from life. What's the idea there? Ve'en tam he says, Rabbi Abraham, the Ibn Ezra, he says, I don't understand why that should be used in the idea of making a covenant with you. Right? Why? He says, I don't understand that. Mm-hmm. What? Um, I think he's trying to say this. Say, you know, salty water is a mixed thing. It has water, which gives life, and it has salt. After the life is after the water gets into the ground and it gives life to plants and it grows, then if it dries up, the salt covers the land and it kills. Right? So salt water is life-giving and deadly. Right? And he's saying the Brit has actually a two-sided sword. It's a two-sided coin. I make a covenant with you forever. And that means we have love between us forever and I have loyalty between us forever. But you watch out, right? Because violating this breed is deadly, right? It will bring us, it will make us enemies, right? Hashem makes a covenant with us, but if we betray the covenant, there is a negative. The covenant actually imposes great uh, anger and great guilt on the part of the person who enters into a covenant who just rejects it. If I don't make a covenant with somebody out there, so he doesn't love me, he does love me. Mm. It's not important, right? Nothing happens. There's no tension involved. But if I marry somebody, right, and she and I have this loving relationship forever, it's great, right? But if one of us betrays the other, then the very covenant that we made is something that brings hatred and anger and punishment between us, right? So it's... He's trying to say that there's a symbol of the idea of a Brit, he says, with Hashem and Yud and Elohim, right? Mm-hmm. Both both the loving aspect and the judgment yes. aspect is involved in the Brit, in the covenant. And that's why Brit Melach is not a bad idea, right? Because the Brit... If put salt water on plants, it doesn't. He's, he, it doesn't. It, uh, it's not good for it. The physical, if you, if you wonder about whether the Ramban is accurate in botanics, you know, in scientific things, it's not always so easy to, to imagine, right? If you take salt water and you put it on something, I don't know if it would grow very well, right? Right? But you have, you, to, you, have to first, you have to first extract, you have to first evaporate the water from the salt and put the water into the earth in order for it to grow things. Mm-hmm. And then if the salt comes, I mean, mm-hmm. his image, his image is a little bit forced. I, I was sc- sort of scattering over it because I know it doesn't hold water, no. so to speak. But it you go in, deep uh, into the ocean, so it's so beautiful because a lot of phantoms, a lot of... There are a lot of plants that grow in the, uh, in the no. ocean. I think... In the ocean. So you mean to say if the ocean plants that are near the coast, under the water, if the water would dry out and there would be only salt, they would die? Yes. Right? As if you want, you could say it's the water plants. How about that? Marine plants. Eh, I don't know. It's, it doesn't sound like that's what he's saying, but you're right. I mean, there are some plants that could grow in salt water, but if it was really salt and concentrated, it would die. Um, Right? Hashem said to, to the Jewish people, yeah, because then he and his children afterward, afterwards, after him, as a covenant of salt, the, the King David. This is also, Melach is the, is the Mida, the attribute of David. 
And I wonder what he means by that. The covenant is the salt of the world. It will be upheld, it will be sustained, and it could be destroyed. Both. In other words, salt preserves meat, but it also prevents land from growing. From growing. I mean, he's, he's trying to say that you see in the image of salt two things, right? Perpetuity, preservation, and destruction. taste, and destruction, right? Mm -hmm. So breed is not a bad use, not a bad thing to use with salt as an image, as a symbol, because it's it's, it's yes, so it's wonderful, and if it's no, then it's terrible, mm -hmm. right? Right. And the king is the same thing. Why the king and the kohanim? A king has power, right? A king is the leader of the people. If he leads the people with his power to greatness, then the leadership is fantastic, and he gives life to the country, right? He gives prosperity, he gives good, good behavior between people, he gives spiritual growth, he gives art and, and culture. It's wonderful, right? It's terrific. But a king, because of his power, can also lead the, the entire nation astray and destroy it, right? There are many kings that we had in our history who led to idol worship and to corruption and to immorality and brought and brought destruction to the country just because of the king. Is because he's so potential, he's so great, the covenant between and God, him and God is a very tense, you know, kind of thing. Very special, but also very potentially destructive. Kohanim also, right? The Kohanim are our representative to the Beit HaMikdash, right? They're going to be our spiritual guides, they're going to be our rabbis, they're going to be, right? But, but a person like that who has power and charisma, you know, and has a special place in the in the Beit HaMikdash, if there are corrupt priests, it is much worse than a corrupt person still just walking around because people got, look up to them as the religious personality, right? So it could bring tremendous destruction. And we've had generations of corrupt priests as well who brought down the, the, the entire Christianity occurred and, and begins to show its power at the time when there was great corruption in the priestly houses, right? So the New Testament talks about the money changers in the temple and all of that stuff, right? I mean, not to find God. Right, right. So, so uh, that's right. So, so again, the priest, the king, and the sacrifices are all potential. The sacrifices also. People used to come to the Beit Hamikdash. I could do anything I want out there in the street, as long as you know I could have uh, idol worship and I could have the fornication and I could steal. But if I come and I bring a beautiful sacrifice to God, then everything is cleaned and everything is wonderful. I have to say, duh, 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 and everything's great, right? So the korbanot could represent something bringing me very close to Hashem, but also could be corrupting, right? Because it gives you an alias, you know, to, to go anywhere, right? So the brit that is for the sacrifice, the king and the priest, is davka brit melach, to show you its potential in both ways, right? Very important to look at it that way, always, right? I don't know what. Salt and the preservative. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, okay, I mean, so that's not bad. Huh? How did we do? How did we do? Not bad. So, actually, the timing is almost perfect. Yes. Um, wasn't that beautiful? So we never got the dvash and the and the um, and the kamets very well, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. the but the melach is very exciting. Right. He starts from this bedrash, which is also beautiful, but uh, but the other one about the salt, the quality of salt, is pretty. Uh, the image is pretty good. It is true that if you look at salty land, it's deadly, done. And it's dome. It's dome. It's described. Gafrit Ramelach. But if you put over so can I look the positive again about salt and it's that, that, that it's preserved and it has great taste, right? Uh, that it, it you, things that you want to preserve you will you will keep forever because you have salt on it. Right? Right. Salt, by the way, was one of the most valuable products in the planet. Not that long ago. I, I you have to get the yeah, book. There, there's there's a, a book called in Salt. The, the in the Roman times, time, in Roman times like a, a they a lay science writer. Oh, they people who went to war over salt. Kingdoms uh, yeah. did anything they can get to salt because without salt, you could not preserve any food. You couldn't transport food. You couldn't have a navy, for mm. example, without salt, mm. right? 
couldn't have armies marching without salt. You couldn't have people have food that they, that they weren't just going out in the morning to eat that day. Mm -hmm. Couldn't have salt. How do you go fishing, for example, for these industries that you had fishing and transporting fish? Salt. Everything. Salt is amazing. <laughs> because right. of that, we call salary. Or salary. Salario. Salary. People were paid in salt. Because they paid in salt. People were paid right. in salt for their work. In the Roman Incredibly Empire. important. Nobody even imagines today how uh, valuable salt was. You couldn't have the world expand and exploration occur without salt. No, you no. We would be no, back no. in primitive uh, cave dwellers if not for salt. That's where we would be. We're just living in the happen here if we don't have salt. Who was the And in the winter time. <laughs> Oh boy! <laughs> yeah, so they found salt. First, they used to get salt only from the sea. You know, they'd have these salt flats, and they would take the water yes. and make them into these uh, swamps. You know, and to bring shallow, and they would have, and they would people would rake it back and forth and back and forth and let the sun dry it out. Right. Mm. And after a while, they found ways of actually using fire, coal, charcoal, to boil off salt seawater to make salt. You know how much expensive that is? Right? But salt was so valuable that you would even mm -hmm. do that. Burn fuel in order to get salt. Mm -hmm. And then they found salt in certain mountains and in certain earth. And once they started discovering salt in the earth, it was like mm -hmm. huge uh, value. Mm -hmm. But it's um, all, all those... Uh, are they from the sea? Is, is the origin of salt? No. It's well, maybe from pre pre prehistoric times, it could be that everywhere you have salt is from the sea. is a sea that once was covered by sea. Yeah. But there are entire mountains of salt, and there yes. are mines of salt right. in the sea, in the underground as well. I in mean, Colombia, there is a mine. It's on the ground. You can go to the to the mountain. Oh, like Poland. Poland. Poland, the biggest salt mine in Poland. You, you to go yeah. in there and there's so, miles of tracks and railroad tracks into the bellies of the earth. And people even carved castles and... And here I knew about the, one of the libraries that preserves the, the, the reels of, of the movies. I don't remember the town, but it is is inside in a in a in a, in a salt mine. Yes, salt mine. because they yeah, preserve huge. Huge. In, in the best way the, the real the tapes the all the the movies that were made. There was mass production of, of vegetables or something in America. The first, uh, you know, uh, what's his name? What's the name of that vegetable? Uh, uh, what's the name of the company? Don't American mind. company. Don't mind. Something that was born from a salt idea. A husband and wife decided to salt vegetables and keep them preserved. That started a whole billion dollar industry. I forgot what it meant. But salt is a very important thing. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, so it gives life, it gave life, it actually gave life to the planet. It's amazing, right? Mm -hmm. And yet, and yet, it could be very dangerous. With the relationship with fresh water and salt water. Fresh water is rainwater that runs over the earth, right? Uh, evaporation that condenses, right? Yeah. Evaporation. If I, when salt, when the seas evaporate, they don't carry salt with them. The yeah. vapor rises to the sky, uh, so and it and it condenses in clouds, and the winds and the trade winds carry them to wherever they're going to carry. And as they're suspended in the clouds, they are vapor until they come to a place where they rise over the mountain ridges and they get colder. And when they get colder, water condenses into droplets and it rains. And it rains on the mountains. And the mountains really have rivers and trickles and they go down into the continent. We can't drink salt water. No. You could, but it would not be healthy. You would, you would, you would, you would require, you require you fresh water. kill yourself. Drinking water. You require water. Day, yes, but, but the cycle starts with the salt water. The cycle of water that we yeah. depend on starts with salt water. But in the in the tabernacles, the, the offering was made with uh, pure water, water. or sea water. 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 Yeah, water which was brought actually from the underground 
The underground water is actually st the streams, you know, the streams, the natural streams that are underground streams also come from the rain. You know, they go into the mountains, they, they get submerged through the earth, they collect into all kinds of crevasses under the earth, and, uh, you know, cisterns and aquifers are filled with fresh water. Yeah. It's dangerous when aquifers become uh, depleted and they're not that far from the sea, and sea water starts seeping into them and it gets salty, then you can't drink it. Mm -hmm. In fact, in Israel, when there's a great drought, they worry about the aquifers that are close to the sea, that uh, sometimes the, the water level gets so low that they worry about water seeping in from the ocean. Mm -hmm. But uh, normally they're fresh water, yeah. Mm -hmm. So seawater is the thing that starts it all going. It's a cycle, a circle that goes on and on and on and on. And of course, all the rivers flow to the sea, right? After they've done their job, and after they fill the aquifers, they go back out into the sea. The Mississippi River piles into the sea every day, all the time, right? And then it goes up again. The Amazon is fresh water, goes to the sea. Huge, the Nile goes to the sea. And the sea brings up all the water again. The sea, same. Sun. The sun. Have sun. you seen the temperature and sun? Yeah, the sun. If not for the sun, we also wouldn't make it. And clouds. That's for sure. Cool clouds. Rain clouds. One day when the sun goes out, if we want to be here still, if we want to be alive, <laughs> then we're going to have to figure out a way to replace the sun. Well, I guess. So. Or leave the planet. You know, go to one of those. You know, they just discovered. Uh, quite a number of planets that are near a star with a proper temperature that they think could have water, fresh water, and life. I mean, that's a, would potentially have life. That's a long time. Long. But to get there, we would have to make a spaceship that would be like New York State, flying with people working and teaching their children and having children and having a hospital and having a doctor and having food and everything else and go on for maybe a million years <laughs> and by the time you get there you, you learn Torah, you have the daf yomi every day, you do whatever you have to do when you get there you open the door and you get onto a new world and you start over. Well, I don't think we have to be concerned about that. It's just a billion and a half years from now. <laughs> No, a billion, a billion and a half years from now, our son is going to be gone. <laughs> so it's not today, and not our children, but... Okay, Mr. So Rabbi. Remember the So Rabbi? The So Rabbi, sorry. No. The So Rabbi. The So Rabbi, who died? The So Rabbi. It's a, a rabbi that always spoke about, uh, speak about the uh, so uh, animals. Uh, oh, yeah? Yeah. And he was banned for uh, a lot of, of, of synagogues and, and uh -huh. schools. <laughs> because he said something about uh, the, the age of our world. It was a million oh, oh, years. Well. Remember that? I see, yeah, but that, I'm talking about the future. Yes. The future, there, there are among things the future is not going to be that long, actually. But the world is going to come to an end anyway. There's a certain limit to the plan. The plan of the world is a certain amount of time and then finished. We are close to this. To this. Yeah, but he, I'm not sure he meant it's it exactly. Millennium, isn't it? Yeah. There's a, there's a, there's a, uh, yeah. there's a Yovel, there's a Yovel. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we are close to the Jubilee. Jubilee. 